Welcome uh, to my talk. I'm uh, going to talk about uh, my uh, music tracker for the uh, TI graphing calculators. Uh, it's called Houston Tracker 2. And uh, okay, what is this thing? Well, it's a tracker, a uh, music editor that runs natively on these uh, calcs. Um, it supports uh, most of the Z80 based uh, models, so that's the 82, the 83, the 83 plus, the 84 plus, and uh, the hundreds of other models that are uh, sort of compatible with these. Uh, it does not, if you have an uh, TI-85 or 86, unfortunately, it does not support those because those have a different uh, way of addressing the screen. And it also doesn't support the color models because the color models uh, don't have, uh, actually, they only have a USB port, which uh, for our purposes is not so useful. Uh, the tracker is uh, free and open source. Uh, you can download it from the internet. I'll give the link in a, in a sec. Yeah, so uh, I worked on this uh, tracker for uh, about uh, seven months, coding uh, like with some breaks in between, coding on it almost uh, every day. And um, actually the history of the whole thing uh, goes back further because, um, yeah, as you can already guess from the, from the name, Houston Tracker 2 is not my first attempt at uh, writing a, a tracker for, the, um, for these calculators. I actually started by, uh, uh, I suppose it different, like around 2009, I got interested in uh, one bit music and uh, sound through, through bit banging. And I got interested in the ZX Spectrum. And at some point I remembered uh, wait a minute, in school you had this uh, calculator and it has like a Z80 inside, so maybe it's possible to port one of the sound routines from the Spectrum to this uh, machine. And uh, at the time I didn't really know anything about uh, coding, so I started to learn some uh, assembly and uh, finally like after half a year or so I managed to, to port a very simple sound routine. And uh, at that point uh, some friends of mine uh, by calling me out on, uh, hey man, can't, can't you write a, a tracker that like runs on the thing? And uh, so I sat down and I, I wrote one that was the first Houston tracker and uh, it totally sucked because I didn't know anything about uh, writing these kind of tools back then. I made a very uh, stupid clunky interface where you had to type in hex code for everything and also was totally buggy and it had uh, shitty note dividers so the, the notes were quite detuned and everything. Uh, and then I let it rest uh, for a while, uh, and then finally, uh, yeah, a couple of years, uh, one and a half years now, I, I think uh, it was uh, one and a half years ago, I sat down again and uh, I started a new attempt, and that's uh, what became Houston Tracker 2. And I'm still actively developing the thing, uh, not every day, obviously, but uh, yeah, I do have a, a new version almost ready, should be coming out in uh, probably in May or so. And uh, yeah, that's the address, I'll, I'll have it uh, later. So, how does it look? Uh, it looks kind of like this. Uh, if you have uh, seen any tracker, uh, it will probably seem fairly familiar. The uh, above screen is the uh, sequence screen, and uh, the tracker has uh, four channels. Uh, three of those channels are uh, tone, so pulse wave channels. And uh, the last one is a global drum and FX uh, channel, which uh, from a musician's point of view might not uh, seem particularly uh, handy, but uh, there are reasons for that. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things my talk uh, today will be about. So I will not be showing the, the, the tracker in a lot of detail. I want to talk about yeah, what the challenges uh, were in, in writing uh, this thing and uh, how I managed to deal with some of the problems and uh, how I managed to not deal so well with some of the other problems. Uh, anyway, yeah, you got these uh, four channels. You got, uh, you got a sequence, maximum sequence length of uh, 256 steps. And below you see one of the note pattern screens. The FX patterns look a bit different, obviously, but okay, here for example is the uh, note uh, screen. As you can see, it has a, a fixed uh, pattern length, and um, you can shorten patterns within, uh, with a command. 
but generally speaking, you have this uh, fi uh, fixed 16 steps. And um, the tracker actually has uh, eight internal uh, backup slots, so safe slots, of which uh, two are always guaranteed to be available. And uh, the rest uh, depends on how large your songs are, if they are available or not. Uh, and um, yeah, there's a, there's a custom uh, compression scheme working uh, on the back end, which uh, is, uh, I'm actually not too terribly proud of, but uh, it, does the, it does the job for now. Um, and it was actually one of the most uh, difficult parts of the code uh, to design this feature. Uh, I think it took like a month before it w actually worked kind of reliably. And I, I'm still not 100% sure if it actually works in all cases because nobody, as far as I know, nobody has ever managed to actually cram all the, the slots full. So I don't actually know what will happen if somebody does that, if somebody uses up all the RAM. The checks are there, but if they work, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I got you guys for. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll give a very short demonstration of the uh, tracker, for which I need your assistance. So yeah, here we go, same screen. Uh, and uh, you got a lazy way of uh, putting in three uh, patterns. So that's what I'll do uh, first. Do line of sequence, and let's go into one of the uh, note screens. Change the octave, because uh, octave zero is uh, pretty low. And let's uh, punch in some notes. And uh, let's also punch in some uh, drums. Yeah, so uh, that's basically how the, how the basic workflow works. And uh, if you're patient enough and you do this uh, for a long time, then uh, eventually you might end up some with something like this. can put this up a little bit, can't we? Okay, so much uh, for a quick uh, demonstration. So, do TI calculators have sound? Well, obviously, no, they don't. Uh, but that's all right, because uh, at, the, at the bottom of these uh, calculators, or uh, at the side, we've got an uh, analog uh, serial link port which is uh, normally used to transfer data from uh, between two calculators or between uh, a calculator and a PC. And uh, these are actually two one-bit lines. And uh, by using the CPU as a sound chip, we can do binary modulation synthesis, so uh, one-bit sound in short. 
Uh, and there, uh, there are several methods or uh, ways you can go about uh, doing this. The, w uh, the one that Houston Tracker uh, uses uh, relies on the fact that uh, CPUs are fast, but uh, loudspeaker cones are actually pretty slow, at least when you compare them to CPUs. So um, the way this works, like imagine uh, you have uh, the CPU and uh, the CPU switches one of its uh, ports from uh, zero to one. And what happens, uh, this happens pretty much uh, immediately. Of course, yeah, there's a number of cycles, but uh, it's negotiable if you compare it to what the speaker cone does. Because the speaker cone, it has uh, natural inertia. So uh, it takes a while before it's reached the expanded state when it is uh, first in the contracted state. So uh, what happens if we do this with the CPU, so if we toggle our, uh, our port rapidly. Well, what happens is the uh, speaker cone can't keep up with the, with the thing, and it will be kind of uh, trapped in limbo. Uh, and uh, with fast and precisely timed code, we can actually control pretty well which uh, position the uh, allowed speaker cone uh, will take. And that's pretty much all we need uh, to mix multiple channels and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I'll make it sound a bit uh, simple maybe, but it is actually uh, writing the uh, sound routine was not one of the complicated parts of the, uh, of the whole uh, tracker adventure. Of course, no nowadays uh, with all the effects that are put in, it's uh, like 90% self-modifying code in the, in the sound loop. So there's actually little left uh, which, is, uh, which stays the same. But uh, well, so let's uh, get to the main uh, part of the talk. I wanted to talk about problems about this whole thing, right? So problem number one is we need to actually run code. And we have a built-in BASIC on these machines, but uh, as you probably know, BASIC is slow and is not actually precisely timed or anything, so uh, yeah, that's uh, not really useful. We need to run uh, machine code. Uh, but TI won't let us run machine code. So um, fortunately, this problem uh, was solved uh, quite a long time ago because yes, where there's code, there are probably vulnerabilities and there are vulnerabilities in the uh, TI operating system and uh, Actually, um, in, uh, already in 1997, that's uh, like four years after this uh, thing came out, there were some uh, clever guys uh, named uh, Matthias Lindqvist and uh, Jonas Justesen. And also earlier on the TI-85, there was a guy uh, named David Boozer. They found, uh, they found an exploit in the uh, operating system, which uh, uh, there's actually a, a jump value that uh, the operating system will write to when, um, when uh, a key is pressed, and you can overwrite this uh, jump value, and uh, through uh, various loopholes, eventually you get to a point where you can execute uh, machine code. Now, this is uh, quite tricky, uh, and um, given that there are many different versions of the TIOS, uh, People invented these so-called shells. These are like little programs that allow you to safely run machine code on the, uh, on the TI calculators. Actually, the newer, like the, uh, the plus models, they can run native uh, uh, machine code, but uh, it's quite limited. You don't get access to the, uh, to the full power of assembly. So uh, even on the newer ones, uh, uh, we have shells to do this sort of thing. So uh, from left to right, this is a uh, crash for the TI-82. Next to it is iron for the uh, TI-83. And then uh, finally, um, on, the, on the right, that's uh, door CS for the plus models. So in order to run Houston Tracker, you always need to install one of these uh, first. Uh, but let's talk about the uh, platform itself. Well, if I would sum up the platform in one word, it'd be dodgy. Basically, you have dodgy specs, you have dodgy documentation, you have dodgy tools, and you have dodgy hardware. And these are obviously all kind of uh, related, but uh, yeah, it sounded cool putting it like this, so uh, yeah. Anyway, 
Um, yeah, we got uh, in these machines, we got a uh, Zilog uh, Z80 running at uh, 6 uh, megahertz, which is actually not too bad. It's pretty nice, uh, considering like a ZX Spectrum runs at uh, 3.5 megahertz, so 6 is quite good. And uh, usually the uh, Z80, in the, in the older models, there's an actual uh, Z80, but in the newer ones, it's actually mostly an ASIC, uh, which uh, combines it with the RAM and uh, all that uh, good shit. Talking about RAM, there's usually like 25 to 27 uh, kilobytes on these uh, machines. Uh, and yeah, that, as you can imagine, is not exactly great if you want to put in a full tracker. Also, mind you, uh, there's no like, there's no standard stores. There's no floppy. There's no tape. Uh, so that's why I had to put. Uh, that's why I had to put um, uh, the safe state uh, thingies, and it all has to run in these 25 to 27 k of uh, RAM. So uh, I think that might explain some of the more crude choices in terms of uh, interface and capabilities of this uh, thing. Like, for example, having the combined, uh, the global FX channel, right? And uh, also the problem is like, yeah, as I said, everything has to be memory resident. And if the RAM clears, which uh, these calculators will happily do at every possibility, then uh, yeah, program's lost. So. Um, yeah, uh, having bugs in there is usually not so great. There's some flash on the later models, but it is known to break after as little as uh, 10,000 uh, read-write operations. So um, yeah, we can't really use that because um, yeah, you'd, you'd end up with a dead calculator pretty soon. And uh, actually, the worst thing about these things uh, is the display controller. There's an LCD display, obviously. It's controlled uh, with a Toshiba T6A of T6K uh, series controller. And these things are super slow. Um, they need at least 100 uh, cycles uh, waiting between each write operation. So each byte that you write to the thing afterwards, you have to wait for minimum 100, uh, 100 cycles, it actually gets worse uh, on the later models. Like on the later models, you have to wait longer. Um, so this is a problem, and uh, this is a problem I have uh, not really fixed because, um, yeah, the thing what happens, whenever I have to do something to the screen, uh, so you can edit uh, your music while, uh, while the, the player is running, but whenever you do that, there's going to be a, a noticeable crackle because I need to update the screen and I need to wait uh, these uh, fucking wait states. Uh, so I can't render music in, at the same time. So you're going to hear that. Um, but uh, well, that's what you get when you try to do trackers for things that are not meant to have trackers. So overall, you can say these things are very, uh, I mean, uh, cost efficiently designed. And actually, with each newer model, they, they get more efficient, and they strip out more things, and things actually get worse. Uh, so yeah, they're really designed uh, with cost reduction in mind. And if you try to do things uh, on these things that are not meant to be, then uh, it really shows. So uh, yeah, dodgy documentation. Uh, TI themselves wouldn't be TI if they would actually document any of this shit. Uh, they have, uh, if you have been busy with like uh, older TI machines like TI-99 or so, they have a track record of not documenting their stuff. And especially in this case, like why would they, right? You're supposed to sit in school and do math with these things. So um, they don't really have any reasons, which means all the low level uh, documentation is by a third party. And third parties in that case means mostly kids from like 15 to seven years uh, of age because like people tinker with these things in school, uh, which means that quite often the, uh, the documentation is simply not that great. So uh, fortunately, uh, even though like lots of the documentation comes from the late 90s, it's actually well preserved because there's this uh, web page called tiCalc.org and they kind of collect everything which is nice you just need to like read 10 different uh, 10 different docs on the same subject to actually get an idea what is actually going on but yeah it's not too bad 
There's also there's a really great uh, wiki, uh, which is put together by some of the veterans of the scene. But unfortunately, it only covers uh, the new models for the most part. So if you want to do something on the older uh, things, it's not really uh, it's not really of much use. So um, yeah, some uh, things I'd actually really have to figure out uh, myself. For example, this is the special, uh, my very special friend. This is the TI-82 Parkus. It's, uh, it's the last of the uh, TI-82 series. It's made in uh, 2001. Uh, and it's actually a very common uh, model. Like, uh, these, these did not sell well, so nowadays you get like, a load of them on eBay. Uh, so, and the thing is, it has a slightly different uh, operating system. Uh, it has quite a bit of differences in uh, hardware, and there's literally almost no documentation on this thing. Uh, and uh, Houston Tracker didn't work on this for a very long time. And uh, it would keep crashing, like uh, the, the tracker would actually run, but when you'd exit the, the thing, the calculator would crash and it would ram clear and you'd lose uh, what you've done. And I had this problem like for months and eventually I, I, I said, okay, screw that, I'm not going to support the uh, Parkers. Uh, hopeless, and I kind of gave up, but it kind of like, it irked me, uh, this being such a common model and stuff, so I had to fix it somehow. Uh, so I uh, at some point I took it up again, and finally, uh, after uh, disassembling some uh, strange uh, uh, software from some French guys who wrote uh, specifically for this uh, model, I figured out what's going on. So here's the deal. Uh, the TI-82 uh, Parkus is made after the TI-83 actually, which is kind of confusing, right? Uh, and the thing is, the uh, different TI models, they all use different values that you write uh, to the link port. So the 82 uses uh, FC to switch on and C0 to switch off, and the 83 uses D3 and D0. So I thought, okay, maybe it's using the values from the TI-83. And I put in these. And the crashes started to look a little different, so I kind of knew that I was on the, on the right track, but still, yeah, it, it did crash. So, okay, mm, maybe it uses the values from the, from the plus series. Uh, so I tried these, and again, the, the crashes were a little different, but um, yeah, no. And then finally, as I said, after disassembling uh, some, some stuff from other people, I found out what's going on. The TI-82 Parkus, as the only model in the whole series, uses these values. Uh, well played, DI, well played. So yeah, that cost like half a year. <laughs> And also, uh, one thing, like the link port on these is really low quality, it wears out really quickly. If you're planning on getting like uh, a TI for, for making music, don't try to not get this one. Uh, the tracker works now, but still, no, don't. <laughs> okay, so, dodgy tools. Uh, yeah, so basically standard tool chain is kind of what you'd expect. Uh, you need an assembler. Then you need a, uh, a kind of wrapper tool because uh, these things have a pretty intricate uh, operating system header which needs to be added, so you need something for that. And then you need an emulator uh, for testing and you need a link program to actually upload the software uh, to the calculator. So uh, the standard assembler for this is uh, TASM and that's not Turbo Assembler, it's Telemark Assembler, which is like a, a commercial uh, DOS tool from way back in the day. And despite being it, it being a commercial tool, which reached like version four or something, uh, it's actually buggy. And uh, yeah, it, it crashes if you put in too many data lines and that sort of thing. So, uh, well, okay, not too bad. We replace it with a uh, modern assembler, done. Then you have the wrapper tool. And again, all the ones that are out there, the original ones, they're DOS-based. So I'm, I'm usually developing on Linux, so yeah. At first I was like fiddling with DOS box and then like scripts to, to run the tools through DOS box and um, yeah, not so great. So there's a modern replacement uh, and it actually claims to support all the models from uh, TI. Uh, only problem is it doesn't. Like it works for the TI-80, for the plus models and that's it. And I've, I've written to the guy, I've told him, hey man, and he's promised multiple times uh, that he's going to fix the thing. Uh, well, no. So 
I ended up uh, writing my own tool, and uh, I actually learned uh, C++ for this because uh, uh, I didn't know before any high-level language. So um, yeah, what can I do? So I have my own tool for this. I think I don't think I have actually released this. I should do this because, like, if you want to do a demo for this thing, it might be handy to have. Uh, anyway, so emulators. They're like three that have sound. There's Virtual TI, uh, the last version, version 2.5 beta 5, which is super buggy, like uh, it doesn't clean up it, its resources, it doesn't close down uh, uh, things it, it opens, so like sound simply stays on and there's like a ghost process running in the back that you have to kill manually. And also it's, it's just for Windows anyway, so um, yeah, not great. Then there's like the darling of the of the scene. So there is an actual calculator scene. We are mainly busy with uh, coding coding for calculators, and they usually use this one, Rabbit a uh, Emu. Uh, well, I find that it's actually not great. It's like super resource hungry, so it, it mostly runs pretty slow, and the sound emulation is yeah quite crappy, and also the emulation of the older models uh, is simply not correct. So that's also out. Fortunately, there's also this one, Tylem 2. So if you ever want to do something for this machine, get, get Tylem 2. It's, uh, it's a great uh, emulator. And I did manage to break it, actually, at some point uh, during development. But uh, the main dev, Benjamin Moody, is a really friendly guy. And uh, he fixed it like within a couple of days. So uh, <coughs> yeah, great uh, if you can work with uh, this kind of people. So uh, yeah. As a decent debugger too, so that's solved, right? And then we have the link uh, program, and that is actually the most tricky part. Like also for users who want to use this kind of thing, it's not such a big problem uh, to to use it. I think uh, I think the interface is fairly intuitive if you ever work with something like LSDJ or uh, whatever. Uh, but getting the link tool to work is, frankly speaking, uh, quite troublesome, and uh, that is. Because like there's the official tool TI Connect, but uh, yeah, before uh, for example for the uh, TI83 it doesn't uh, transfer uh, assembly programs, and there's also no USB port, uh, no USB support for the uh, TI82. So um, yeah, that's kind of useless. And there's like um, there's like a third-party tool called uh, TILP, uh, actually TILP2. And that one is, uh, unfortunately, especially on Windows, it's really tricky to install because it has to, it has to uh, do low-level access for the, for the USB stack. And that's not something that modern Windows uh, would like you to do. So uh, you can either crawl up their uh, asses and try to get your uh, thing signed, or installing is going to be a pain. And uh, they actually chose for the second uh, route. But on the other hand, um, once you get it working, it's, it's a great tool. You also have command line access. So uh, like for, for quick testing, this is uh, great. And also the guy uh, who's the main developer, Lionel DeBrew, is a great guy. He's uh, actually passed me on quite a bit of uh, documentation that's not online. So I could, uh, for example, for this wrapper tool, uh, he gave me some shit that I could actually figure out what I have to do. So um, yeah, unfortunately, it's a hassle to install. But what can you do? And finally, last of all, uh, dodgy hardware, which kind of ties in with the dodgy specs, I admit, but still. So the first problem is there's like loads of different models, not by number, but there's like model revisions, there's different OS uh, versions. And if I say loads, I mean loads, like literally. Like for the TI-82 alone, this is the original uh, TI-82. And this already comes in like two versions uh, with uh, I think a total of eight different operating system uh, revisions of which most are actually buggy. So, uh, and then we had the, the, the gray version, which is uh, this one. Fortunately, just one operating uh, uh, system revision for this one, uh, but still slightly different hardware than the older one, so you gotta pay attention to that. And then uh, we have the round, uh, TI-82, which is pretty much the same as, as the gray one. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the bespoken uh, Parker's model, right? So you th you'd think that got to be enough, right? No. There's also the TI-82 stats, 
which is actually a, uh, a, uh, a bit uh, simplified uh, TI-83. So it runs the TI-83 operating system. Uh, and then there's like two French versions of the TI-82 uh, stats, uh, again with uh, different hardware inside and also uh, different operating system as far as I know. Uh, and then there's, a, then, then there's a backported version of the French one, so another international TI-82 stats, uh, which uses the hardware from the uh, French ones, but again, different operating systems. So, yeah, surely that's going to be enough, right? No. There's also the TI-82+, Plus, which is actually based on the TI-83+, Plus, uh, which missed some uh, feature that is required by new uh, exam regulations in, uh, in France and in the United States. So they discontinued it after one year, and they brought out the TI-82 Advance, which is based on the TI-84+. Plus. So that's how it goes with these uh, things, right? Uh, so how does Houston Tracker uh, deal with this kind of problem? Well, uh, actually, it's a, it's a mixture of different things. First of all, I have four different executables for the main uh, model generations, let's say. And I have a special one for the, for the Parkus, actually, because of the uh, aforementioned uh, problems with the, uh, with the link port values. And there's no way of auto-detecting this or anything. Also, like I simply try to avoid uh, using the operating system at all. It's not uh, totally possible to avoid it, but uh, I can mostly rely on the shells to deal with the differences. Uh, also, like, yeah, there's lots of uh, assembly preprocessor switches, and there's some auto detection and automatic patching, especially between, uh, uh, within the plus models, because there are some differences there. Uh, and I also simply ignore some of the more esoteric hardware. Like, if you have a TI-82 with a very early uh, operating system revision is simply not going to work, I'm sorry. That is just too much work. So uh, let's mo talk more about uh, dodgy hardware. Really great design. The link port is connected directly to the CPU. Yeah, there's some resistors or whatever in between, but other than that, it's pretty much literally a wire going directly to the, to the CPU, which is um, kind of questionable. Well, um, the, uh, the specific problem here is, if you, the, uh, the TIs, they have active linking. Like if you plug in a link cable and you start to transfer data, they will actually trans uh, realize that there's data incoming. Uh, so if you plug in headphones, they have the, a, little, a little bit of uh, current flowing back uh, from, the, uh, from the ear shells, right? So the uh, TI will actually pick that up as, uh, as incoming data, and it will start pulling the data port, and it will slow it down to about 1% of its normal speed. So you press a button, and then uh, you go get a coffee, and uh, if you come back, maybe something has happened. So yeah, there's not really any solution to this. Well, you can, uh, oh. you can obviously uh, disable interrupts, and then this polling will be disabled, but uh, you can only do that once, uh, once the tracker is actually running. So I need to instruct users to please not plug in the headphones before you start up the tracker, which is kind of annoying, but uh, I haven't really found another solution to this. Uh, also, the two input-output lines, uh, as I mentioned, there are two, and uh, Houston Tracker does have stereo, but the two lines are not shielded from each other, which means uh, like if you use the stereo, it will be pretty noisy. But uh, OK. Speed. The normal clock speed of this thing is uh, 6 megahertz, as I mentioned. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't have the frequency tables tuned to 440 hertz. But uh, at some point, I was like, OK, yeah, let's, uh, let's tune them. Might be useful if people want to use it like in other setups. Uh, and I did my calculations, and I calculated the dividers that I have to use. Uh, it turns out something is wrong. It doesn't work. And also, I started to figure, hey, it sounds kind of different if I use a different calculator model. So it turns out, realistically, these things have uh, speeds ranging from uh, 5.6 megahertz to 7.2 megahertz. And that's not the real problem. The real problem is that uh, the clock speed depends on battery strength. So uh, yeah, if the batteries are like 50% full, it'll drop uh, to like 5 megahertz and below. So 
uh, to this day, uh, Houston Tracker unfortunately does not uh, produce an, an accurate 440 hertz tuning. Well, another very nice problem. There's no, uh, there's no hardware key debounce. And you'd think that um, TI uh, might have learned from their debacles uh, in the 70s. Uh, well, no, they actually don't care because the operating system is so slow that it's never a problem for them. So they don't have to debounce. Well, you have to debounce in uh, software. And it needs quite a bit of weight states. And the weight states actually differ between the models. So uh, considering like I don't want to wait too long because I don't want to have big interruptions uh, when you edit the music, I try to keep it down as much, but yeah, I have to vary it uh, per, per uh, model. And um, also, the same thing uh, goes for the display driver. The display driver, as I mentioned, is super slow. And the delays vary between all the models. So again, you have to do patching and this uh, sort of thing uh, to deal with that, which is uh, super annoying. Uh, yeah, but that was probably my uh, favorite uh, bug that turned up during development. Uh, I don't have an 84 plus myself, so a friend of mine was uh, testing on uh, 84 plus. And Tracker works fine on the 83 plus, which technically speaking is uh, more or less th the same thing. But on uh, his machine, sometimes it would crash after five minutes of using, and sometimes it would crash after like half an hour of using, like randomly, no, no apparent uh, way to reproduce it uh, reliably at all. And uh, actually thinking back, I already had this problem with the original Houston tracker, and it never got fixed, I simply gave up on this. And uh, when I started uh, Houston Tracker 2, it took me another five months to figure out what the hell was going on there. Uh, at some point, I read about power saving, because obviously these things run on batteries, so if you can reduce the power consumption in software, uh, that's maybe a good thing. And that's when I came across the thing. So the new 80, uh, the 84 Plus has USB, and the USB is always on, which means it draws quite a bit of power. And if you send something to the analog link port, obviously it draws power too. And if the whole calculator draws too much power, then it does an emergency re uh, reset and it clears its RAM. So uh, yeah, we would figure that TI actually, because this is a valid use case, right? You can use the, uh, the, the USB and the link port because the newer ones they also meant to control like uh, little uh, uh, little hardware projects and this kind of uh, thing. So this is a valid use case. But yeah, they didn't choose for actually making sure that there's enough power. No, they put in this emergency reset and they clear out the RAM. That cost me like a lot of nerves. So um, yeah, this is actually uh, all for my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. And these are the links. Um, where you can get the uh, calculator, uh, the tracker, sorry. And um, yeah, give me your calculators. I need more calculators for testing. Uh, OK, I have one little uh, bonus thing, because uh, Andy asked um, what I'm uh, doing nowadays. And uh, so I have uh, this one. This is the uh, 92 plus. It runs a, uh, uh, it has a 68K uh, processor at, uh, at 12 megahertz. And uh, I wrote uh, just a little sound routine for it. I'm not planning to do a tracker for this thing because uh, not so many people have this machine. But um, yeah, here's a little demonstration of what you can do with a little bit more CPU power. Do we have sound?
uh, in the hall later and I'll uh, give you a private demonstration, I guess. So, uh, yeah, as I said, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, this, uh, this is like a simplified four-channel mod uh, kind of thing. Uh, it's like, it's, I don't think there's a limit on it. It can, uh, it can be normal sample, just like these things have uh, 180k of RAM or so, so you'll run out eventually. Yeah. How did you, uh, did you fix uh, the problem uh, with the um, tuning? Uh, I, I didn't, it still doesn't run at uh, correct uh, tuning. Like, given, given that uh, if it would run at uh, 6 megahertz, if you manage to uh, get the right constellation of model and uh, battery fill state, then it will run at 440 uh, megahertz, but, uh, kilohertz, but otherwise it doesn't, sorry. Okay, uh, you, you announced uh, this uh, uh, with uh, Houston Tracker, uh, uh, with the first uh, version of Houston Tracker, and uh, the version two um, uh, uses the same uh, tuning. Uh, like no, no, no. This, this is this is like this is version two. What I'm uh, showing yes. now. The first the first one I didn't uh, show. Uh, it was like uh, this this really crappy tool without actual notes and and okay. stuff. You would like. Put in uh, literally, you would put in the dividers uh, yourself, and they were like eight bit, which is not enough range. Okay, uh, thank you. Sure. Any more? Then uh, let's enjoy the rest of the. Uh,